Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm still like a alcoholic. <laughs> To God's Grace, this program is sponsorship. I am Von Nessa, who take a drink since the 2nd of June, 1981, and for that, I'm truly grateful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you. I want to thank the committee, truly. They know me, so it's really an honor for them to ask me to come out here <laughs> and share with you all. Um, I, I know a lot of people out here, and I've met some people this weekend. It's been a fantastic fantastic. We, up to now, it's been like absolutely great. Uh, speakers were outstanding. Uh, Scott and Shelly and, and Connie, who shared her, you know, her from, the, the, from the delegates, uh, part of the delegates report. If you missed that, you really missed something. It was really nice. Um, and uh, Todd, starting off Friday, it's been just absolutely fantastic. This is my first time in North Platte. I feel like a visiting dignitary for a lot of reasons. <laughs> 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 for a lot of reasons. We won't go into that, but but we've had a great time. Roxanne and I have been well treated since we've been here. We had a great time and, and um I'm I'm just really thrilled. I'm really happy to be a part of the Area forty one reunion. I'm certainly happy to be a part of anything that involves Alcoholics Anonymous because I owe Alcoholics Anonymous everything. Absolutely everything in my life I owe the Alcoholics Anonymous. I love June. June is a great month for me. Like uh, uh, Scott, your speaker last night, I share, uh, I have a belly button birthday and an NAA anniversary in June. And of course, Alcoholics Anonymous celebrates its anniversary in June. So it, there's a lot of things that are great about June. I feel excited about June. I get, I get really self-centered in June. So you guys, <laughs> you guys are in trouble, okay? <laughs> but it's a wonderful time to celebrate. And reunion means, you know, to get back together again and celebrate and everything like that. And if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous or you're new to Area 41 service, or you're, you're new in, in the fellowship that you're a part of, and wherever it's at York or in Lincoln or wherever, Scott's Bluff, if you're just new, if, you, if this is new to you, understand one thing, that there's cause for celebration. Now, they call Sunday morning the spiritual talk. I don't know why they call Sunday morning the spiritual talk, because every talk or every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, in essence, is spiritual. It's a spiritual entity. That's what the long form of a 12 tradition talks about. So they're, they're all spiritual. But what's wonderful about Alcoholics Nam is what makes it so wonderful is that we get an opportunity to celebrate, which is truly spiritual. Celebrate our sobriety, celebrate our safety, celebrate our, our fellowship, our capability of being here because a lot of us don't deserve it. I know the person standing in front of you today don't deserve it. I did not cure cancer to get in Alcoholics Anonymous. I always say I did not uh, see the light. I felt the heat. You know, <laughs> what got me in Alcoholics Anonymous was trouble. I was in trouble, and that's what you know motivated me to show up here. And you know, as a result, I've st I'm still in trouble from time to time. But the thing is, I've, I've got a, a, a hell of a life today. You know, um, I, my full name is Sterling David Holmes III. Isn't that something? <laughs> when you got when you have a Roman numeral at the end of your name you're supposed to get a country to run <laughs> that's how I got on the planet waiting for my country <laughs> Louis the 14th Charles the 3rd you know I'm, I'm waiting for my country I got a little sister moved into my room you know I got resentment <laughs> immediately you know the thing is I grew up in New York you know where they make it South Bronx where they make all the movies at and that in and of itself does not make me an alcoholic. My family, to my knowledge, I'm the only alcoholic in my family. My family is not dysfunctional. I mean, only when I'm in it and messing with it, then it's <laughs> dysfunctional. But when, you know, but they're a fine bunch of people, nice middle class family, you know, but that doesn't make me an alcoholic. The fact that I grew up in the South Bronx, you know, the fact that, but I always thought because I watched so much television that if I had a different life, you know, I wouldn't have had all the problems. But, like, was talked about this whole weekend. You know, I, I'm different. I'm just different. You know, it was mentioned about kindergarten. If, if, uh, Scott was talking about taking a shot, man, before kindergarten. If I had had a sponsor in kindergarten, I think it would have been cool. 
just so I could have called somebody, you know, because I felt different. I walked in that class full of these five and six year olds and I felt like there was two groups, me and all y'all. Yeah. And I needed, it would have been nice to be able to make a phone call. And, you know, so you could tell me, eat the cookie, take the nap, you know. <laughs> That's all you got to do. <laughs> call me later. We'll get through finger painting together, you know. <laughs> I mean, but even then, I wouldn't have followed instructions because I'm, I'm chronically self-centered. You're chronically self-centered. So I'm always thinking about me. What about me? What about me? Me, 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 me. I mean, for the time, I can remember thinking. And the only time that's interrupted is when I'm hanging out with you and y'all ask me to do something. You know, and then I, I have to stop thinking about me to help you. And that's been saving my butt for a long time now. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that because I would have been destined. You know, I'm so self-centered. I'm so weird. I was, I was weird. I, I thought that maybe if I, I watched television a lot in the 50s and 60s. And, and on TV, you had these houses, you know, these split-level A-frame houses, manicured lawn. Mom always had the apron on. The hair was always done. She had cookies on the stove. Five o'clock, Dad comes in, throws the briefcase in the living room. Honey, I'm home. You know, they have dinner. Junior screwed up. They fixed it in a half an hour. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what I wanted. I wanted that kind of life because you can look at me and tell mom wasn't Donna Reed. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I figured if I had had that split little A frame, leave it the beaver kind of lifestyle, I'd be OK. Well, I've gone to thousands of meetings of alcoholics novice. thousands. I've been sober a long time. I've gone to thousands of meetings of alcoholics novice. I've sat right next to people that have had that kind of lifestyle, and they're just as screwed up as I am. So it makes no difference where I grew up, how I grew up, when, when, who the people were where I was growing up. What makes me an alcoholic is the fact that I got an obsession of the mind, and I have an allergy of the body. And by the time I was 13 years old, this obsessive mind had driven me out of my mind. I was crazy. Because I was worried about you finding out that I wasn't enough, that I didn't measure up. I compared my insides to your outsides, and I was always found lacking. And I needed something, absolutely something that was going to be, be, be able to breathe in and out on a daily basis without being so scared all the time, on condition yellow all the time, ready to respond. You know, don't know what I'm worried, ready to respond to, but I just, I'm ready, you know, because I'm worried. Y'all going to find out. And I don't know. I don't know. I want, I want to be a part of. I'm not sure I like you, but I need you. And at 13 years old, I thank God for a tall can of Code 45. Because if it hadn't been, there'd be somebody else here. I'd have blown my brain. You can't live a life like that and make it. Puberty is tough enough for the average human being. A chronically self-centered, fearful alcoholic of my type, I needed something. I needed a suitable substitute. And alcohol came along on a summer's day in the South Bronx, tall can of Coke 45, and I felt like, when I took that, that drink back, I felt like I could speak as well as Jesse Jackson, play sports as well as Reggie Jackson, and dance as well as Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it works for me. That's what alcohol did for me. If you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, you wonder why we get so worked up. When he was talking about that shock, when he was talking about some of the stuff we was doing last, when he was talking, Scott was talking last night, why we get so worked up about it is alcohol solves problems for us. Because we got problems that we create in our head. Whether they are real or imagined, they're still problems. And alcohol solves them, Jack. Like that. And, and I, it worked so well, I kept working it when it would put me in situations where I got in trouble. When you got mad at me, I still did it. I still loved it. And when it turned on me, I had developed a habit so bad I couldn't leave it alone. Now, if I had never had a first drink, I'd have had all these alcoholic tendencies and I'd have maybe been somewhere else. But I drank. And because I drank, I developed an allergy. Once I started, you know that tall can fix me so well. You know any, like like, uh, like my, my friend said this uh, earlier, uh, Bill said, um, for, uh, Saturday morning. Anything worth doing is doing to excess, you know, and I did it. I loved alcohol I, because it was it solved so many problems for me. It worked so well, and I kept doing it. I was 16 years old, and, you know, when you're trying to, I was dating this young lady, 
and her ex-boyfriend showed up at this party. And when you're dating a girl and you really feel insecure when you're a teenager, you, you try to do things that you do best, you know, trying to show off. So I challenged her ex-boyfriend to a drinking contest because that's what I do best. We were drinking hot, cheap gin on a summer's day in the South Bronx, and I won. I also passed out. It became a slumber party. <laughs> I woke up the next morning. I was embarrassed. Once I had found out what had happened, they had put me in the shower. They tried to wake me up. I was, I was really suffering from alcohol poisoning is what I was suffering from, drinking gin like that, the level that I was drinking it. And uh, I was embarrassed, but I blamed the whole thing on bad onion dip. <laughs> had to have been onion dip. There is no way it could have been other alcohol that got me to that state. It had to have been some of the reaction I had to the onion dip. Now, I have never seen... Anybody in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous has been, one of them little cards has been pulled over for having one too many strawberries. <laughs> or an allergic reaction to tacos that get you in front of a judge. I mean, just, it doesn't happen. It's my reaction to alcohol that puts me in these situations that are bizarre and sometimes tragic. And often on Sunday morning, they were sad. If there is anything that is spiritual about a Sunday morning for me personally is around this time in the morning, I was coming too. And there were people who were around me that were wondering why I did this stuff to myself and why I was doing this stuff to them. Like Shelly like Shelley was talking about the seven people I affected with my illness. On Sunday morning, it was apparent. Because on television over in northern Japan, Robert Shuler would be talking on the, about possibility thinking from his Crystal Cathedral in California somewhere, and she would be sitting across me from me on the couch, and she would be asking me those questions that people that hang out with alcoholics always ask alcoholics when we come to or we revive or we stumble back in the house. Hey, where have you been? And you know our answer, nowhere. What have you been doing? Nothing. Who have you been with? Nobody. You know? Where's the check? <laughs> you, know, you know, they ask us all these questions and, you know, we, we respond either with anger or violence, or, but it's always the same thing. You, we can't tell you what's wrong because we have no idea. And those were the loneliest, saddest times for me, those Sunday mornings, when I had shamed myself and shamed her and, and broken everything that I had violated every law or principle that I thought I needed to live by because I wasn't raised like this. And here it is, 10, 10, 30 in the morning, and I got no clue. And nothing's right. And I, I hate my life, and I'm in my, I'm in my early 20s. I remember those days, and if there's anything spiritual about being up in front of you on a Sunday morning is that I remember that, and I'm a damn sight far from that. Today, I'm a lot better because I know how to love and I know how to give and I know how to be in where I say I'm going to be when I say I'm going to be there. And it's because of you all. You taught me how to do that. And, and it's, it's a great deal. But it didn't look like, you know, growing up in the South Bronx, my mother was a narcotics officer. Made me real popular in the neighborhood, let me tell you. <laughs> so she taught me a lot about drugs. There's not a lot of drugs in my story, not because of not opportunity. I had plenty of opportunity. I tried to stuff, just didn't work for me. Alcohol worked. So I continued to use alcohol, but I got in trouble and I got some things. And I always wanted to join a gang. You know, when, when you're in the South Bronx, you run in the streets in the early 70s, it was very popular and very safe to be involved in a gang. And I always wanted to join a gang, but I had had some intelligence. My mother and father realized early on that I was somewhat smart and they sent me to some very good schools. And, and as a result, in my neighborhood, I had a reputation of being somewhat of a, a brainiac. Um, and because of that, many of my friends who were in gangs wouldn't allow anybody to allow me to pledge into a gang because they, I had a chance of maybe getting out of that neighborhood with some intelligence. Anybody that really had a chance of getting out of the neighborhood, either through ability or sports or intelligence or talent, they really nobody wanted to participate in their own destruction. That doesn't mean they didn't destroy themselves, but they had to do it by their own hand. That was the way the gangs were back then. It's a little different now. But I wanted to join a gang, and, and none of the other gangs would take me. <laughs> so I decided to join a big gang, the Department of Defense. <laughs> you know, join a gang that's got nuclear weapons, you know? I mean, because when we go to a gang fight, somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> now, when I joined, when I raised my right hand to join the United States Air Force, they did not think they were getting a, uh, an alcoholic. 
an up-and-coming young alcoholic. But by the time I was high school, I was full-blown alcoholic, blacking out the whole deal. But nobody knew. I didn't look like alcoholics look in New York. So when I joined up the service, they, they gave me the contract, and they thought for four to five years they were going to have somebody they could train and send places, and I thought I was going to get an education and get some money. And what they were doing was they were making my alcoholism possible. They weren't enabling me. They did not wrestle me to the ground and pour Jack Daniels down my throat. But what they did was they provided the Petri dish for the development of my alcoholism. And what that was was if you're going to do alcoholism right, you need a couple, a couple three things. You need an income. You need a place to crash. And you need three meals a day in the beginning. Now, the income don't have to be yours. <laughs> the, place, the place to stay don't necessarily have to be yours. And the food ain't that big a deal towards the end. No way. <laughs> but that's all they did. But they provided that to everybody. I mean, they were giving me a job. So, of course, they were giving me an income and a place to stay. But So I went. I left Mommy and Daddy, and I joined the Big Daddy Air Force, and my alcoholism bloomed. It blew up. It just expanded because now I'm like self-centered and I'm getting a paycheck and they didn't care what I did as long as I showed back up where I was supposed to be. And if you're an alcoholic of my type, you know you're not going to show up where you're supposed to be. Can't. You just can't. Because if you're doing drinking and working and you got to choose between the two, when do we usually make our best choices? On one or two o'clock in the morning when I'm already blasted. So, of course I'm going to keep drinking. So I'm not going to make it to work. <laughs> you know, it's just not going to happen. So you can't be a good good employee. But you know they hired me, and I I just went forward. I went crazy, and I got in some trouble. And you know because I'm self centered, because I'm having some problems, living life on life's terms, because I'm always thinking about me, and I'm always looking about what's best for me. I I, I knew I needed a solution. I needed something to kind of straighten me out. And I figured it out that it was a relationship. Yeah, I needed somebody to help me love me. You know, now alcoholics don't date. Alcoholics hunt down and capture. I found the object of my obsession and I locked on. Now, I used to say, I still say, I still have this opinion that there are people that meet alcoholics and sense the danger and they run. And I believe that al Anons don't run all that fast. <laughs> But now I'm starting to believe, I've, I've been hanging out with a few of y'all, and now I'm thinking that maybe y'all are the ones doing the chasing. And we're just the ones being captured. So I'm, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know. I'm still I'm working that theory out. Because y'all are crazy. I love the program. If you have not had an opportunity to listen to Al Nod Speaker, if you're an Alcoholics Anonymous, new in Alcoholics, or, or old in Alcoholics Anonymous, have not had an opportunity to listen to an Al Nod Speaker, or talk to some people, or, or just listen to an open, or go to an open meeting, or something like that, to, to experience what people who live with alcohol, the family disease of alcoholism, is all about. You are missing a part of what is your program, because this is not a self-help program. It's a help others program, and a major portion of them others is the first fellowship that you and I are all a part of, and that was our family and the fellowship of mankind. I was a member of the, fellow, of the Holmes family before I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, certainly the minute I started breathing it out, I was a member of the fellowship of mankind. I have responsibilities to both of those areas. And as a result of being sober, I'm, I have some commitments that I have to make to the, both of those areas, to my family and to the world at large, because I owe you. And, you know, Al-Anon has helped me be able to understand that because there are people who just have the misfortune of being in love with people who are chronically self-centered, who are self-destructive, who are egotistical and arrogant and most of the time crazy. And they don't deserve half of the stuff they end up with, but they stick around and they keep the faith and they do their deal because that's a problem for them. And I always say you need a God to live with a drunk, whether you be the drunk or you live with the drunk. You need a God to live with a drunk. And I'm so grateful that Al Anon has given my family and my relationship with my wife a God so that she can live with me. Because I'm blessed as a direct result of that. And I'm grateful to the program of Al Anon for that. And I, but I think that, you know, what we have is a dynamic. When we're sick, it's a pretty cute dynamic. I mean, there are some things going on, you know. I mean, really weird. And I promised this woman everything that I possibly could imagine. I really wanted her in my life. But when you're an alcoholic, you can't be a good dad. You can't be a good husband. You can't be a good employee. You just can't. Alcoholism takes everything. It's a rapacious creditor. It takes it all. Everything. It took my self-respect. took my ability to be with other people. The loneliness that all of us have experienced at those times in our lives 
where we really needed another shoulder to cry on, and we have done so many things to other people, there is nobody around. And that's the deal. You know, that loneliness is what I, I was destined to have. And you can't have relationships when you're destined on that kind of road. And, and that's where I was ended up. We went overseas to northern Japan. And uh, just before I left for overseas, a terrible thing happened. My mother got hit by a car and knocked about 50, 55 feet. Was put in a coma and on the 2nd of September 1978, she passed away. And uh, that sparked the last couple of three years of my drinking because there was a lot of guilt involved with uh, the loss of my mom. I didn't treat my mom very well. She was the smartest, one of the smartest women I ever met. Taught me how to read before I joined the first, before I got in the first grade. She was, um, she was a wonderful lady. And she just loved me. Every once in a while, mom would drink. You know, mom would, mom would have a few drinks. And I don't know if, if mom would drink because of the disappointment she had. She wanted to be a teacher. She ended up a narcotics officer. Not a big, you know, deal there. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know if it was because of the disappointments in her marriage. Mom and dad had gotten a divorce when I was about seven or eight years old. Um, I don't know. But every once in a while, I'd come home on like a Friday night when I was in high school, and mom would be passed out laying there under the stereo, um, listening to these old records, you know, the old Jerry Butler and, and Marvin Gaye and, you know, oh, just oh, listening to them over and over and over again on the stereo. Yeah, back in the old days for newcomers, we used to have these little black discs that were called records. Um, we put them on a piece of, and, and we put a needle on it and it made music. That's, you know, so, that's for newcomers. You know, you know. But I would turn this thing off and I'd put it to bed and I'd say to myself, I will never, ever, ever, ever do that. Never, ever. And I never did. I mean, I passed out on the couch and I played Earth, Wind & Fire records, so it was a whole bit different thing, you know. But I used to say that when I was in big trouble, I would blame it on my mom. You know, if you knew where I, if you lived where I lived, if you had the broken home, if, I would use my mom as a scapegoat whenever I was in serious trouble for my drinking. For my drinking, I would blame my mother. I would call my mother an alcoholic. And the thing is, if I'm not willing to call you an alcoholic, even though you may stroll in here with bourbon bumps on your pick-em-up truck, leading a procession of wives and parole officers and finance companies and everything like that. I don't say you're a drunk until you say you're a drunk. I can't call my mom a drunk because she isn't here to defend herself. And if I can't call her a drunk, I'm not an adult child of a drunk. I'm just an adult that tends to be childish. <laughs> so, but when mom went in the ground, I had some serious guilt. I had stolen from her. I had not treated her very well. And that guilt is the thing that sparked the last two years of the last two to three years of my drinking, and it was insane drinking because it was drinking built upon guilt. We don't know how to handle guilt. Since we're chronically self-centered and we're always doing stuff to people and not feeling good about it but don't know how to handle, don't know how to interact, don't know how to apologize, don't know how because we just don't know how to do that stuff, we drink on it and drink on it and drink on it, and usually it stays down. But most of us have had the experience, and I heard it talked about a lot this weekend, when it doesn't stay down. No matter how much you drink. And it was starting to happen for me. That insane drinking. I happened to be in northern Japan. But they drive on the wrong side of the road. You know, and it was sometimes I get so drunk I couldn't figure out what side of the road I was supposed to be on. So I'd drive down the middle. You know, which is bizarre behavior. And always, 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 when an alcoholic starts doing that kind of stuff, when we get to the point where we got to drink all the time and a lot to kill these demons that we're fighting with, we start doing bizarre stuff that makes society go, uh-oh, because they just don't like that kind of stuff. It makes them nervous when we do our thing. And they know exactly what to do with us. Put us in them rooms where there's a little slat on the door, you know. <laughs> there's no doorknob on our side, you know. <laughs> They give us clothing that have very long sleeves and a lot of belts, you know, <laughs> because we're dangerous. We're a hazard to the society at large. So I was doing bizarre stuff in, this, in the, the Air Force, decided they're going to hit me because I'm in trouble. So I got to get hit. So we're going to hit them. They put me in this local program for six weeks. They're going to hit me. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we had to go to group. So we'd sit around Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and group one another. And the contract was that you couldn't drink or take drugs, because there were some people doing drugs in the military at that time. You couldn't drink or take drugs for the six weeks that you were in this local program. That was a contract you signed it. Okay, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. No problem. Six weeks, I can stay away from it. Six weeks, no problem. No, no big deal. You know, you know I was a joy to be around. 
Monday through Friday, I was spreading warmth and sunshine everywhere I went. Because you know what it was about. I wasn't drinking. I would go by the club to get some of that Japanese money, take my family out for a nice dinner on the local economy. And I would stroll into the club. I would go into the, cl- the bar to see my friends. I mean, these are guys I've spent a fortune on making them my closest and dearest friends. <laughs> and they're sitting around and they're telling their stories. You know, they're talking about Vietnam stories and they're having a beer and a rum and, and drinks and vodka and this, that, and the other. And I'm having a Coke. And they're telling some more lies and I'm having another Coke. And pretty soon I'm having a rum and Coke and I'm telling Vietnam stories. And I joined in 77. It was over. <laughs> I remember reporting my car stolen in the back of the club, and it was the only car in the parking lot at the time. And when you do that, they won't let you drive it. And they figure if you can't find it, you can't drive it. So my behavior became more bizarre, and they figured they better intensify treatment. My commander called me into his office. He said, Sterling, you're a good troop. We really, you know, you've done some really good work, but you've got a problem. And you have two weeks to decide. You either volunteer for inpatient treatment at a a regional medical center in the Pacific Theater, or I will send you by my order, and if you don't make it through there successfully, you're out of the Air Force. Now, needless to say, she's pissed off at me. I've got a young baby girl, and I've got a wife at home. She's not happy. And the Air Force has given me two weeks to make a decision. And you know how long it took me to make that decision. Two weeks. That's the whole thing about alcoholism. If you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, what Alcoholics Anonymous is trying to give you is a way of life that will free you from your demons, that will make you a functioning, relatively happy member of this society at large, that will give you some peace of mind and some happiness and some joy that you will have never imagined. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is trying to provide you with. And the alternative to that is maybe passing out and dying in your own urine. And most of us have to make a conscious decision about that. We have to think about something like, let's see, okay, insanity or death or happiness and usefulness. All right, um, I'll get back to you. (laughs) The only disease in the world where people who suffer from it are unwilling to do a damn thing about it. Everybody else, would, if you, they would chew through the walls. Which this place, you couldn't have it in North Platte. If, you, if, if this was like an AIDS deal and we could cure AIDS with just calling a guy and reading a book and showing him at regular meetings, you couldn't have it in Nebraska. It'd have to be held in a Superdome somewhere because people would be all over the place try, climbing all over this, pay any amount of money. And all we ask you to do is just show You ain't even got to put nothing in the basket. And sometimes we can't get 15 people at a meeting because alcoholics are like that. And it took me two weeks to make that decision. And I went down to treatment thinking that all I had to do was go down there and do my little song and dance and I'd be fine. And it took them 30-something days to teach me everything that I knew about alcohol. It taught me all the movies, every Father Martin movie I've ever seen, I saw there. I'll quit tomorrow. I saw the, the cirrhotic liver pictures. I saw, oh, man, it was, when they were done, I felt so sorry for you people. <laughs> I was willing to make a donation. I mean, really. Because y'all were in bad shape. But I didn't take none of it personal. You know, because it just didn't seem, I couldn't be, I was too cool. 20-something years old, there's no way I could be an alcoholic of your type. They sent me back to the base with them little diplomas. I was voted most likely to drink six months after getting out of here. I got a little diploma. And I went back to this meet, this little, they had the little AA symbol. You know the little silver AA symbol with the, the blue and the silver AA. We put it right over the rec center. It's right there where the meeting was. Take Off Pound Seriously was also there too. But on, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Saturday nights, it was AA. And I went and climbed those stairs, and I went in that door, and, you know, I saw... What I hope is your experience, my experience when I walked the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, I found people that were smiling from ear to ear. They went, hi, how you doing? My name is so-and-so. We're about to start the meeting. You want a cup of coffee? We're going to have a meeting. We're just happy to be here. <laughs> you know, I mean, just, just happy. I ain't happy. I got this little three-by-five card. I've been sentenced to Alcoholics Anonymous. Ain't nothing funny. 
You know, how dare you? And they looked like they just loved and loved and wanted me there and were so happy. to say, how dare you love me? I don't love me. Well, how dare you love me? And I sat there. I was looking around. I see a picture of these two old white guys. <laughs> this 12 steps and 12 traditions. Okay. Another painting of three white guys. One of them sitting on the bed, two of them talking to them, what I thought was a Bible. So I ain't asking no questions, you know. And then, you know, you started the meeting, and you started with a prayer, you ended with a prayer, and you passed the basket. That's when I realized what this was. It's like, oh, okay. Started with prayer, ended with prayer, passed the basket. This is a cult. Okay, I got it. Y'all going to jump me to Jesus. I got it. All right, or make me shave my head or sell books at the airport, something like that. You know, I know. And I knew all about God by this time. I'd grown up in Catholic school, went to Catholic school all the way up to my first year of college. You know, but I left the Catholic faith very early in my career, practicing Islam for a little while, practicing African religion, you know, Yoruba. There was a girl that uh, I wanted what she had, and I was willing to go to any lengths to get it. And she was, uh, she was singing in this Baptist choir. So I joined the Baptist choir. They got loaned out to a Methodist church. So on any given Sunday, I was a hungover, failed Catholic who was a practicing Muslim singing in a Baptist choir in a Methodist church. <laughs> I had the Book of Quran, I had the Holy Bible, I had everything. I would have arguments with a 36 ounce bottle of Colt 45 in my underwear. I'd have arguments with Jehovah's Witnesses and, lit, and went. They would leave. That's how much about God I knew. And every one of those religions that I spent time in, I'm going to tell you, I met people who had done a good third step. They had made a decision to turn their will and their lives over to the care of whatever their, their God was. And they lived their lives in accordance with that decision. And you know these people made me uncomfortable. I always hung around with the ones who half measured everything so I could poke holes in those particular religions. And now here I was faced with a bunch of people that were committed and had done a, and made a good third step. And I thought y'all were a cult. But you didn't put the strong arm on me. You know, I was waiting for you to ask for the donation for the school in Africa. Or, you know, I was waiting for you to do that. And you didn't do that. Instead, what you started doing was talking about yourself. And you talked about yourself in a way and matter I had never heard other people talk about themselves. And I'm from New York. You keep secrets. You just, no, no, you don't t tell anybody anything. And y'all were just saying things that were out. And, you know, I've been to six treatment centers, and I wrapped six cars around a pole. Ha, 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 laughing, just, just laugh. People are laughing. They're breaking out in laughter, you know. I mean, yeah, I, 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 you know, I tapped out when they finally got me. My point, my blood alcohol was three through. You know, I should have been dead. Ha, 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 you know. And I'm like, you, I was embarrassed for you, you know. It's like you shouldn't be talking about this kind of stuff. But something about that, you were so free and easy about yourselves. You were so welcoming to me. You had this thing locked down in some way or fashion that it didn't seem like you were as afraid. It didn't seem like you were as crazy. It didn't seem like you had as much negative stuff going on as I did right now at that point when I walked in the door. And that's what made me attractive to you. The fact is that you were crazy and the fact is that you were weird and I wasn't sure that I trust you made me interested. But the fact that you had a solution is what brought me back here. The thing is that we always have to lead with a smile and a handshake. But we got to remember that when they walk in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, they're broken folks. And they're not seeing everything that we're putting down. So sometimes this just has to be a safe, well-led place like I hear in my home group a lot. Sometimes all we can do is just outreach, hold our hands out, and wait for them to come, and then hold on. Because it's not going to make a lot of sense. It certainly didn't to me. I had a lot of old ideas, and those were keeping me from the sunlight of the Spirit, and they certainly were keeping me from hearing what you were trying to say. But like I heard last night, what you were doing spoke so loud, I didn't really need to hear what you said. You did stuff. And the stuff you did had impact, like the, the doctor's opinion. What we have to say has to have depth and weight. And your actions had depth and weight. You welcomed me. You smiled. You looked. You listened. You told me the truth. And that's what kept me hooked up with you. I was curious. How can you people be so damn happy and not be drinking? Something's got to be going on here. And, of course, you know, I hung around with those folks for a year, and, and then they tricked me. I'm going to tell you, if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, and those of you that are in Area 41 know that this is a service deal, so you, you've had this experience. AA groups are cunning, baffling, and powerful. They'll make you do stuff that you don't want to do, you know? 
they'll suck you into some things, you know, before you know it. You're in the middle of this stuff. You know, they walked up to me and said, Sterling, we, we need your help. Uh, we need a chairperson for the meeting, you know. So I thought, okay, great. I'm eloquent. I can handle it, you know. And so I would have to be at the front with the gavel, you know. And, and what that did was I was new. I had all kinds of crazy things going on in my head, and I would have to share them, you know, because I'd have a topic. And I wasn't reading the book. You know, why read the book? And stop it. So I, and they, they would spend the rest of the time 12-stepping me, you know, because whatever I was talking about, they could understand, they could identify with, but they had solutions, you know. They sucked me into to being a coffee maker. I remember I, I used to get there an hour early for a 20-minute commitment, and then, you know, and we had like maybe 15 people show up at the meeting. I'd do 15 or 16 of them little yellow cap things into the, you know. Oh, yeah, service work. You know? <laughs> I know if I don't make the coffee, drunks are going to die. You know what I'm saying? So I'm putting 15 in the... And they're drinking espresso. They ain't drinking coffee. They're drinking espresso. You know, I mean, people's eyes are closed. They use a lot of cream. It's great. Two weeks we drank that stuff. I still make bad coffee. I still, to this day, make bad coffee. But uh, they, two, three people volunteered at the end of those two weeks. We got in a circle. Thank you, Sterling. Keep coming back. <laughs> It was a guy named George. George used to like hugging folks. Now, I'm from New York. You don't, you, you're another man. You ain't hugging me. Sorry. You know, and George finally called because the room we were in was little. It was a really small room. So he chased me around this little room to hug me. <laughs> he finally hugged me. I got hugged. And I was starting to really like going to these meetings for these hugs. So now I'm thinking like three, four months, five months old, but I'm gay. <laughs> Because I'm liking George's hugs too damn much. <laughs> if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to have crazy thoughts. I beg you. I beg you. <coughs> true. If you're having crazy thoughts, share them with an old timer. He ain't got nothing else to do. <laughs> because you got a lot more crazy thinking to do. You got to get past some of these initial ones, you know? I mean, you just walk up to them and go, oh, Joe, I think I'm gay, you know? <laughs> They'll ask you a few questions. They say, well, do you love your wife? Yeah. Okay, do you like guys? No. Well, then you're not gay. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and you go on with your day. Because if I think about something too long, what I start doing, I'm going to buy a dress and leave my wife. And then, you know, I, I got to do all this stuff. <laughs> Like was like Scott was talking about last night that you know you got three things. Well, I don't do three things. If I could get it down to three, I'd be doing all right. Cause I think 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 think. You know, I mean that's the way I do stuff. It gets in here and it rattles around in there like marbles in a bowl. You know, what I mean it's just and it's oh man it's uncontrollable. So I was getting all kinds of crazy thoughts and, and everything, but I was hanging out with you people. And after a year sobriety, after a year's time with you all, I loved alcoholics and I loved it. Had one small problem. There just wasn't enough African Americans in Alcoholics Anonymous as far as I was concerned. So I was going to dedicate my life to getting thousands of black people in AA. Because I wanted another picture up on the wall. <laughs> you know, you got Bill, Bob, Sterling. <laughs> Hey, the next generation. You know what I'm saying? I rewrite the book later, you know? We can always get around to that. I come back to the States. I meet, I go to a meeting. There's thousands of black people in AA. Been so belonging to me. Pissed me off. I get stationed in northern, um, uh, actually Florida, in, in the Panhandle, um, in uh, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And there was a group there called the Dedication Group. The Dedication Group was dedicated to the treatment center that was there at, at, at Eglin Air Force Base. And this group was very active, and they were very motivated. And they, they needed an alternate GSR, and I got elected. They, we elected, you know, because I went to the restroom. That's what happened. I went to the restroom. I came back. Had a job. Congratulations. You the GSR. I, I know how to spell it. So I'm walking around. Hi, how you doing? I'm Sterling. I'm the alternate GSR. <laughs> and the guy would say, well, what does that mean? I go, Jim, you want to come over and explain to him? Uh, I am. I didn't even go to a meeting. I didn't know what the heck, you know, what it was all about. I hadn't worked the steps. I would like to tell you that I got a sponsor immediately. I didn't. I was sponsoring myself, so I had a, like, well, like Bill was talking about, I had a fool for a sponsor and a, and a bigger fool for, for a sponsee, but I was doing it myself because I hadn't figured it all out. I'd read the book, 
I, I'm reading through the book. I'm doing this deal. And I got desperate. I, you know, I couldn't stay sober and keep some of the stuff that was wearing on my head from the days, from the, the drunk days. And I, I got it down on paper. I got it down on paper well enough to be able to go to a priest and do a fifth step. And it was a good one because I stayed here. I didn't drink. And the one thing that I did do, even though I didn't do the program all that right and I, I wasn't getting the sponsor, I wasn't as active or as honest, I was attending meetings regularly. Now, I understand the difference between the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I understand the difference between the program and the fellowship. I do. I truly do. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous has just solidified my relationship with a power greater than me, and I have a more meaningful relationship with my God, which means that the relationship I have with you all is in infinitely better than if I did not have that relationship with God. But I know that the biggest influence of my life has been you. I know that when I look in your eyes and I hear what you are saying, you motivate me, you inspire me, you piss me off. You do the things that you do to me that make me motivated to go live the other 23 or 22 hours I got to be out there in the world. I need a God with some skin on me, and I see it when I go to the meetings. So it was the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that held me close. Now, I understand that we like to do a deal a certain way, and I know there are a lot of different ways to do this deal. But I know I found the way I need to do it because I continued to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. If I didn't, I would have been doomed. I'd be drunk. I'd be dead. There'd be somebody else here. Because the message I'm giving you isn't unique to me. I heard it all this weekend. Anybody can say it. And most of us can live it if we have the willingness and the honesty and the open-mindedness. That's the deal, man. This is not difficult. It's simple, but it's not easy. But a price has to be paid. And I had to get rid of the self-centeredness, and I had to get rid of the selfishness, and I did that with a fourth and a fifth, with a, did a fifth with a priest, and I stayed here for a couple of years. Unfortunately, because I didn't do it the way I'm do, I was doing, I was taught to do it, or the way I've been taught to do it later, I got to a second and pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization at five years sober. I was either going to kill myself or get a sponsor. Equally tragic decisions, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> That I can always find, you know, I can always kill myself later. I better get a sponsor. So I, I decided I'd get a sponsor. God, with a sense of humor, sent me to Omaha, Nebraska, which did not sound like AA Mecca. <laughs> but I went there and I went to a meeting. I started going to meetings in Omaha and I went to a little meeting down the bottom of this Catholic church. And you, what I saw was what I had seen when I first came in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of people happy. They were, hi, how you doing? My name is so-and-so. You got to be here. And they just dancing around. Everybody's just, just, woo, you know, just happy, happy. You know, just happy. Just happy. <laughs> you know, happy. Excited. Enthusiastic. You know, just happy to be sober. And, and you know, there are people, they're there, they're crazy, they got bright red hair sticking straight up and they're <laughs> clapping. And I thought the guy was from a mental institution. I later find out he was sober longer than me. You know, I'm like, what, what is going on here? This is a pandemonium. What is going on? All these people. What's the deal here? And, I, of course, I got attracted to it because it was free and it was easy and it was welcoming and it was wonderful and it was exciting and invigorating. And then this man walked up to me with a meeting schedule. And this man took it upon himself to piss me off. He circled several meetings in that meeting schedule, and he said, if you don't want to hide in Alcoholics Anonymous, go to these meetings. Now, I was pissed off. I took his inventory that day. I took his inventory the next day. I took his inventory the third day. I'm five years sober. How dare you? Now, I'm going to tell you, if you don't have a sponsor, and you've taken somebody's inventory for three straight days, they're the same sex as you, get them for a sponsor. Because at least they can do some cleaning if they're going to spend that much time upside your head. <laughs> I asked him to be my sponsor. Now, I had heard at many a discussion meetings, because I go to a lot of discussion meetings. When you're not sponsored, you go to a lot of discussion meetings. So, Because you want to hear what you really want to do. You don't want to hear what you really have to do. You want to hear what you really want to do. And the more discussion meetings you go to, the more you're going to hear what you really want to do. Because somebody will say something insane, and we just love insane, don't we? We remember insane for weeks, months, years. Can't remember what our sponsor told us yesterday. But we can remember somebody saying something crazy or insane, man, from 10 years ago. You know, and that's the way my brain is working. And I, you know, I just didn't, I heard in these discussion meetings that, you know, obvious that usually the person getting the help isn't as help near as much as the person giving the help. So it's really a privilege 
for a person to sponsor another individual. So I'm figuring my sponsor, Reggie, is going to be thrilled to death that I've, you know, I've finally given in. You know, I mean, he made me say please. Pissed me off. He had some other things that he asked me to do. And one of them was if I was going to attend his home group, which might become my home group, but certainly was his, that I dress up. Now, I wore a shirt and tie through eight years of Catholic school. I wore a shirt and tie in the military. I wore a shirt and tie to whorehouses. Okay. <laughs> this man was only asking me to wear a shirt and tie for maybe two to three hours on a Tuesday night. And you'd have thought he'd asked me to, to slit my child's throat because I was just pissed off. I was sitting there tight as tight as AA Nazis and such, such, such. these principles before personality. I'm telling you, this, this, this. I'd whine and complain. I'd pull into that parking lot. I'd say, I'm going to fire him. I'm going to fire them. I'm going to go to meetings where they're all pissed off where AA's supposed to be. You know? <laughs> this is ridiculous. I'm just wait, working way too hard to try to stay in this group. And I'd get down them stairs, and we have a long gauntlet of people that you have to meet and greet before you can actually sit down in our meeting. You know, we love to do it that way. We want to sing happy birthday, and we want to, we want to get people standing up when they don't even want to be there. And we, I mean, you know, we do a lot of that stuff. So by the time we get through all that ritual, I was in love with you. See, because this, this is what I like. I like the animation. I like the excitement. I'm, I'm an alcoholic. I feed on this kind of stuff. But the thing I also needed was I needed the structure and I needed the principle. And that man, not by browbeating me or making me memorize passages out of the book, what that man did for me and what he continues to do for me today is he shows me aspects of his life where he has made a complete and unadulterated surrender. He has made a complete and unadulterated surrender to his sponsor, to the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I get to watch what happens. And I have seen this man over the last 15, 16 years change. And as a direct result of him changing and him helping me, I know I have, because I have grown. There were things he taught me in the beginning. When my first marriage, he taught me that being a man in my home meant that sometimes I had to actually take out the garbage. That sometimes I had to wash the dishes. That many times I had to keep my mouth shut. I was not in charge of making sure she knew what her character defects were. Now that was a bold concept to me because I thought it was my purpose in life. You know, and I had to leave her alone and let her have a God and whatever God that was. And, and over the years, by my association with the people in my home group and my association and, and my commitment to him and, and the things that he had asked me to do, I started to become better. I grew up. I went through the steps. I learned how the traditions in my life will change my life, make me humble enough to see what is truly the magic of dealing with other people. Because I don't always see that. You frighten me most of the time. But when I can get, in, in, get online and get hooked up with my higher power and work these traditions and work these steps from, to keep that relationship solid, what happens is you become wonderful to me. You become entertaining. I enjoy the time I spend with you. That's all I ever really wanted. So at nine or ten years sober, I was, I had almost had my hand on that AA brass ring. I climbed the stairs one evening and asked my wife, she wanted to stay married to me, and she said no. And she took that little girl. And her, and her name went back to the East Coast. And I'll tell you, I was devastated. I really was. I thought I had failed as a man, as a husband, certainly as a father. And Alcoholics Noms, I've heard it all this weekend. When we have tough times going on, Alcoholics Noms always steps to the plate. People in the fellowship always know. Sometimes more than you'd like to know, know. Sometimes they know without you telling them. But they know, and they step to the plate. My sponsor and a couple of guys reminded me that I wasn't the only man in Alcoholics Anonymous ever to get a divorce. And that was a hard thing for me to get through, but I got through it. And I made, a, a res uh, I made an inventory, and I made a resolution between me and my God that I wasn't going to live my life that way again in a relationship. And with his sense of humor, he sent me another relationship, a relationship that I could be honest in, a relationship that I could do differently, a relationship that you know, I could be for real about and, and put some things in my life that would make these things solid. And, and I have a good life with my wife today. I have a good life with the relationships that I have with my kids and my family today. And it's not because I'm a great guy. It's because I learned how to practice on some of you. I learned how to greet you. 
I learned how to sponsor. So I got some guys that are just strange. I, I don't know about y'all. You spon- I sponsor some strange guys. These guys are really self-centered. <laughs> and some of them aren't wrapped too tight. And many of them, you know, they, they have these ideas that don't work. And I, I, they call me with them and I help them get through not doing that stuff but doing some other stuff and their lives get better. And I know I got it from Reggie. And I know where Reggie got it from. So it must be working for me. And that's the way I go through this thing. I react to the best in you. But I love the worst in you. I love what makes you ill. I love what makes you diseased. Because when I walk in the door, I don't have to feel uncomfortable. I don't have to be afraid. I know where you're coming from. And I know I get to watch where you're going to go. And our relationship today is a direct result of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, we had to go through our, our time. And we started dating after, soon after I got divorced. And the Air Force sent me to California. I didn't want to go to California. I didn't want to leave the fellowship I craved, you know. But, of course, my ego kicked in. And may, maybe those people out there need an answer, you know. <laughs> hmm. So, you know, one uh, in November of 92, I believe it was, yeah, November of 92, I went I left Omaha, Nebraska, headed west. That's my first time I went through North Platte, as a matter of fact. It was November of 92. And uh, was heading west. I was going to go to Sacramento, California, come down on, out, of, out of Reno and save everybody because I had an answer for them. And, you know, my God with a sense of humor broke down that car in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Transmission <laughs> fell out of that Nissan Stanza that I had. And um, I found three things in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I found a La Quinta Inn. I found uh, an Amco station for the car, and right off of Main Street, just kind of far by the Pizza Hut, there's a trailer. There's an Alamo Club there, and Alcoholics and I walked in, pictured them to a white guy. <laughs> Big old orange ashtrays like we used to have, you know, the meetings. Beat-up desk, always a beat-up desk. You know, guy named Jim, always a guy named Jim. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous. Went to California. Reggie had given me three names of some people that were active in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in California. Now, I've got to tell you, I've been a lot of places in AA. I never give up a home group. I'm a member in good standing of the Masao Air Base Japan group. I'm a member in good standing of the Rantoul family group in, in Rantoul, Illinois. I'm a member in good standing of the Overtimers group in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm a member in good standing of the Fox Hill group, which is my present home group in Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm a member of the Clone Thursday Night group in Sacramento, California. I don't give up a home group. The reason why I don't give up a home group is because i got to put the time in there. <coughs> and I'll tell you, if you don't know whether or not a group is your home group, when you go to your meeting, if this is your home group, when you walk up to the resident old time and you stick your head out and they go, oh, jeez, he's back. <laughs> That's your home group. <laughs> you got to be there long enough to be a burden to the people that have been there before you. <laughs> That's why I don't give them up. I put my time in there. And the deal was, you know, I got to Sacramento, California, and I was sca- I got scared. And if you get scared, stuff stops. I don't care where you are in your program. I don't care how good you look or how much you work or how much service you're in. When you get scared, it stops. And I got scared. And they weren't doing it the way they were doing it back in Omaha. And I got scared, and I stopped. <laughs> And I stopped growing, and I stayed away from meetings for a while. I was judging the ones I was attending, and it just wasn't working out for me. It was feeling uncomfortable. And it took somebody that was trying to kill themselves to bring me back into the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. Guy called me up and said, want to say goodbye. He was going to kill himself. And I said, you can't do that. Hang up. I'll be over. And I went and grabbed him and took him to me. Now, I don't know where that young man is today, but he saved my butt because I had to get back in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. That is the safest place for me, getting back in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got involved in a lot of things. And just about the time I was starting to really get involved in Sacramento AA, somebody walked up to me and said, we need your help. And, you know, whatever I can do for you fine people. They wanted me to be involved in intergroup. I didn't want to be involved in intergroup. I knew what intergroup was all about. I know what you service people do. I've been in, oh, no, no, no. That's what my mind said. My mouth said, I'd be honored. Thank you. <laughs> and I got involved in rewriting bylaws because whenever you're in intergroup, you've got to rewrite some bylaws. It's like a rule. we got bylaws we got to rewrite. Something we got to do. I got involved in the central committee, and I got involved with the central office committee, and I got involved in alcoholism in service. 
and I had to climb into that 12 traditions and I had to call my sponsor and whine, 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 whine about how powerless I was over you people. If you would only do what I tell you, we'd get along fine. And I had to learn how I had to surrender to a power greater than me. That all you were trying to do was the best you could for the newcomer too. And that somehow or another we were going to have to get to a point where we had to make a compromise. Isn't that something? We don't hear that a lot in AA. Compromise. Some of us don't know how to spell it. (laughs) Compromise. You know, and in order to compromise, I have to give up a little something. And in order to give up a little something, I got to get some humility. And in order to get some humility, I'm going to have to give something up. The price has to be paid. I got to let go of the self-centeredness. I got to let go of the selfishness. I got to let go of the my will or the, you know, my way or the highway kind of stuff. I got to get that up so that when the opportunity presents itself, that we as a group can help the one that's walking in the door. We do it the way it's always been done so that it has the same effect from now until the end of time. The deal is, in the 69 years that Alcoholics Anonymous has been going on, we got a little formula. That formula is we look them in the eyes, we say hello, and we tell them who we are. That's the formula. One drunk relating to another. That's the formula. That's the secret. That's the magic. Everything stems from that. And what we're supposed to do is to maintain that. And however way we got to maintain that, in whatever form we got to maintain that, that's what we do. But we got to be unified in doing it. This, the magic has to be the same wherever we go and however we do it. I mean, everywhere we go in the world, that's what it's all about. That's what service is all about, trying to get it all the same. And we all have to be there on the same page. And, and, and it's hard work. I know that. I got involved in it, and it was the greatest thing in the world for me. I hated it every moment. I'd call, I'd do the work. I did the work. And I, I got involved in some other stuff, and I got embroiled in the singleness of purpose controversy. And I just, and I, I, I shared my opinion. I didn't share what the, the, the fact that AA doesn't have an opinion. I shared my opinion, and it got me in some trouble. And I had to back down, and I had to admit I was wrong, and I had to do all those things that are humbling when you try to share your opinion, especially when you think you know something. <laughs> and I thought I knew something. I don't know anything. Thank God we got all this written down. Because if it had been up to me, I'd have changed it. I'd have rewrote the book, like I said, after a year or so. And all of us would be dead right now. <laughs> so the deal is I had to learn how to surrender. I had to learn how to get humble. I had to learn how to be of service. I had to learn how to be a maximum. Maximum. What is ma- maximum means? Maximum. The most. Absolutely. Maximum service to God and to his fellows. And if I'm not in a fit spiritual condition, that ain't going to happen. That just ain't going to happen. And I had to learn how to do that in California. And I had to learn how to be of service. And, and I got some guys to sponsor that were, they had real problems other than alcoholism. And they were, they were talking to me about, well, what about this and what about that? I said, I don't know. Let's go in the book. Let's look down and see what happened, what's going on here, you know? And I had to learn how to do the work, and I had to show up at places. And I had to maintain that enthusiasm. And in order to do that, I had to regularly attend meetings. And I had to call my sponsor. And I had to be willing to work the steps. And I did it. And not because I'm a great guy, because I'm still the asshole I was when I walked in here, 2nd of June, 1981. But you had taught me. You gave me examples. My sponsors gave me examples. There was an old guy named Ben that used to drive me all around Sacramento. Never took an interstate. Not once. (laughs) Took me to all these different meetings all over town. He was a blue-eyed old Navy chief. I'll never never forget him. Ben went to big meet. And he was 30-something years when he left. And he was a great guy. He was just, he was so kind. And he was so caring. And he was so loving. But he knew this program. He was always in my case, but he did it in such a nice way, you know, that just, he took my inventory and I was smiling when he walked away and I was like, <laughs> he just hurt my feelings, you know, <laughs> but he was a nice guy and I wanted to be a lot like Ben, but I, I had to go my own road. And of course, you know, the Air Force with its sense of humor decided to want to send me to Korea and, and I decided that we had maintained this relationship so far, long distance for so long, that it was just inevitable we needed to be together, I thought. And I'm always thinking, you know, I'm always thinking, 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 you know. But she said she, 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 was, she thought it was a good idea, too, so we got married. You know, I, we had an AA wedding. It was a guy who came out of retirement, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, came out of retirement to do our ceremony. Howard, Howard stood up there and, and married both of us. And we had an AA wedding. Now, Roxanne and I have very small families. 
there were about twice as many people here that are here now was at my wedding. The, the ceremony took 20 minutes saying hello and goodbye to everybody. took an hour and a half. <laughs> both of both our family, both of our sides of the family were looking at the back going, how, do you know all these white folks? They thought they were there for another wedding. <laughs> Isn't that great in AA? When somebody gets sick or somebody's having an event, we all become family. And, you know, and the nurses and the, char- and the doctors always, you have a very diverse family. They always say that because I'm his cousin. Yeah, you know what I mean? You know, you got high, low, black, white, short, tall, you know, everybody coming, showing up. Because that's the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I, I know that there's a strong delineation between the two. But what I'm trying to say, I guess, in, in my own way, is the Fellowship of Alcoholics Nam is a wonderful place. And it needs to be maintained. And the only way it can be maintained successfully is by the people in it. A family is strong when the members of the family all know where, they're, they're, where they fit. You know? And that's the deal. We are the membership of Alcoholics Nam. We are Alcoholics Nam. We hold on to the program and we embrace all of the principles and these traditions and the concepts and we have to keep this deal going because nobody out there knows AA the way we know AA and nobody out there needs AA as much as we need AA. And that's why we have to stay strong as a fellowship and that's why we're so effective and so formidable when the people that come in here with maybe problems other than alcohol walk in the door. They need to see us. And we need to tell them who we are so that they can make a decision, a qualified decision, on whether or not they want to stay. Because we lose a hell of a lot more than we get. And we don't need to be losing any more folks. Most of the people that have been on this committee from District 20, I have watched grow. I've watched these people become the men and women they're supposed to be. They weren't like that when I met them. They weren't wrapped too tight. Especially him. <laughs> but the deal is, I have watched, I've watched them and my sponsor and my grand sponsor and even my great great sponsor, great great sponsor grow into wonderful, loving, talented, interesting, sober people. Now, we talk about miracles. We take them for granted so often. We just kind of matter of fact about the fact that everybody in here, whether you be associated with a drunk or you are the drunk, it's a miraculous thing that you're sitting here this morning. Because what we are is we are episodes of cops. (laughs) What we are is we are obituary entries. What we are are stories that are written or we are the, the stuff that is on, the, on those psychologists and psychiatrists' couches because our children end up victimized and crazy. But because we are here and because we know how to stay here and keep the institutions strong that bind us all together, our children don't have to go through that. I've got four grandkids, four, and they're all more self-centered than I am. Most days it's okay. <laughs> Some days I get a little jealous. But the deal is, I don't want AA to disappear. I hope I'd never have to have a chair for any of them. I don't, I don't wish alcoholism on my worst enemy. I love alcoholics. I hate the disease of alcoholism. I love alcoholics. But I don't wish the disease of alcoholism on my worst enemy. And I hope none of my children ever have to come in the doors of alcoholics now. But if they do, what I want them to see, picture them two away, guys. 12 and 12. I want them to meet people that I met when I walked in here that have a smile on their face, that have the enthusiasm, have the principles, and have the program of Alcoholics Anonymous so that if they have a problem, we have the solution. And I don't know. They're five, ten, five, three, two. It's going to be a while. So I'm responsible. I'm responsible to make sure that the people in my circle hear about how Alcoholics Anonymous works for me. <laughs> and I'm responsible to help participate in making sure that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous gets as wide a dissemination as it possibly can without promoting itself. I'm supposed to make it attractive, so I have to be an attractive member, and that gives me my responsibilities and that gives me my requirements. But I like being an enthusiastic, attractive member because it makes it more fun. 
confuses the hell out of newcomers. And sometimes it even pisses off a couple of old timers. And I really enjoy that. <laughs> I like being in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous because I got a big mouth and I like to be seen. And I used to say this a lot, and I'm starting to bring it back. I want to be an old black man in Alcoholics Anonymous. Missing teeth, the hair gone, in the wheelchair in the back, falling asleep during the meeting. That's what I want to be. <laughs> That's what I want to be. Because if I'm here and I'm with you, I'm safe. And if I'm here with you, I've got a job. And if I'm here with you, I've got a God. And with a job, with safety, and with, with, with a God, I'm all right. I can't drink. I just can't drink. You're new in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to close here with a little story. There was a guy trying to paint his house. And he had a two-year-old helping him. And you know, when you got a two-year-old helping, there ain't no help. <laughs> just ain't no help. He decided, he found a, a magazine that had all of the pictures of the continents. All of the, the, the continents of the world, the oceans, tore it up into pieces and gave it to the child to go into the room and put the puzzle together, thinking that keep, keep the child occupied for a little while, he can get some work done. Ten minutes goes by, finish. He's amazed and impressed, you know, because there were some places he wasn't sure where they would go. He said, how did you do it so fast? He said, well, there was a man on the other side. You put the man together, the world comes together. I came in Alcoholics Anonymous with a lot of issues, a lot of old ideas, a lot of problems and difficulties, a lot of ineptitudes and inadequacies. And you accepted me and said, well, you know, Sterling, you've got a lot of issues, and I know maybe everybody needs to die just as rep retribution. But before we do that, let's put all of that aside. Let's give you a place where you can come and talk about it. Let's give you a, a God that loves you. Let's give you principles that you can work and practice here that maybe, maybe will work out there. And in arms with all of that, let's go on and take on the world's problems. The stuff I came in here with is not the stuff I have today. I trade it. And I'm blessed because I trade it up big time. I owe. I still owe. Every day that I breathe in and out sober, I owe. I defy anybody who's new. To give this thing that kind of effort, give it that kind of motivation to just stick around here long enough to really understand what it is you're turning your back on if you walk out the door. But I defy you, man, it's 60 days or 90 days or 200 days or 215 days or 325 days or whatever days it takes. I defy you that if you give it the same kind of enthusiasm you gave drinking, that you won't be given the keys of the kingdom. I'm grateful to be here and sober. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.